Gospel of Mark, where we will be reading from chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. And as I read these words, would you listen for a good word from the Lord? Jesus went again beside the sea, and the whole crowd gathered around him, and he taught them. As he was walking along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were also sitting with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came to him and said, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus said to them, The wedding guests cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them, can they? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast on that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth onto an old cloak. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost. And so the skins, so are the skins. But one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Well, up until this point in the gospel of Mark, it would have all seemed like good news. For those in the Jewish community who would have been following Jesus around, who would have heard from his teachings and his preaching, who would have witnessed the miraculous acts that he was able to perform with his own hands or simply by speaking a good word to someone, to this point, it would have seemed like good news. It would have seemed like when he told them that the kingdom of God was at hand within him and moving around them, they would have said, at last, this moment that God has promised us that we have been praying for is finally here. This is indeed good news. Well, it would have been good news up until this point, because until now, Jesus has stayed within the acceptable Jewish community as the good Jewish people would have expected him to. He was going around with Jews like him as they would have imagined that he would. He had called his own followers, that band of 12 that, that are, are there for him and, and, and with him and that he will pass on his, his own kingdom and ministry to. And he's called them from the acceptable religious and righteous community. Yes, he's dabbled a little bit in healing those who would have been looked over and stepped over. He's healed a man who had leprosy, and he's healed a man who was paralyzed until Jesus told him to get up and walk. And people would have overlooked that because even though they would have been on the outskirts of the community, they could have said, look at what amazing things God is doing through this particular man. Praise be to God that at last life is given even to those who did not have a sense of fullness of life. But this is the point in the story where Jesus goes from preaching and teaching and healing to meddling in their understanding of the way that God works in the world. Because he starts moving towards those that were definitely outside the community, those who were not allowed to come in to be with the good and the righteous people. And so they come to the point where they must ask themselves that deep theological question that we have all had to ask of ourselves at one point or another. Is the good news really all that good when I realize it's not good news only for me? Is the good news still really that good when I heard it first for me and I recognized the healing and the mercy and the grace of God and felt that love as that story was told to me? But does it become a little less good when it starts going and moving to people that are not quite like me, who don't look like me or act like me or believe maybe exactly like I do? Is it still as good as it once was? Are we open? 
If the Spirit starts doing something new among us to getting on board with whatever Jesus is doing, or are we at risk of being like an old piece of cloth where a new patch is sewn on it and the tear just gets deeper and deeper to the point where the old cloth just needs to be thrown out? Or are we so withered and dry in our understanding of things that if new wine were to be poured into us, we would simply crack and shatter under the pressure of the newness of it? Or is there something of the Spirit at work within us to constantly be renewed, constantly to be filled up with new life and Spirit as Jesus would pour it into us, and even to use the image of our passage today, Would we be okay if we walked by the lunch table and saw Jesus eating with other people when we thought he was only going to be eating with us? Thomas was a friend of mine when I was a boy. We were together almost all the time. I was at his house, he was at mine. We went to the same church, which meant that we went to the same kindergarten, and we eventually went to the same elementary school. We played together all the time. And when we were together out on the recess field and on the playground, after our classes had all been together at lunch, Thomas and I played together. Now, I will never forget the moment in first grade when Thomas's class was already outside and my class finally went out and he was running around with some other kid on the playground. I remember very vividly as I called out to him, Thomas, let's go play. And he stopped on one of those wooden suspension bridges between the monkey bars and the slide. And he just kind of looked at me awkwardly. And he looked from me to the other kid who also had stopped and was looking at me pretty confused and awkward as well. And Thomas looked at me and said, I think I'll play with him today. I had to stop and think about that. Wait a minute, we can be friends with other people? I should have grown a little bit in that moment and should have thought that perhaps we could all play together But there was something inside me that said, no, if if I'm here, Thomas is supposed to be playing with me. He can play with that other kid if I'm not here. But if I'm here, he plays with me first. Now, here we get to a moment in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus starts moving and pushing the boundaries and even breaking down barriers of what it means to be brought into the good and righteous kingdom of God. But if you follow Jesus throughout all of the Gospels, one thing becomes abundantly clear. Jesus is always moving towards those people that everyone else leaves out. He's constantly moving to the sick and the marginalized and the poor. He's moving toward the orphan and the widow and the children who had no rights. He's moving towards the women who were told there are only certain places that you can go and you have no voice. And in this case, he moves even beyond them to those who were kept on the outside because they were simply unclean. And everyone who is watching this is left to say, now wait a minute. That's not how I understood it to work. That's not normal. That's not the way things are supposed to be. He was coming declaring good news, and now I'm left to question if it is really good news for me or not as we watch in amazement and maybe even astonishment as Jesus passes by the table reserved for the religious social club and goes to the rejects table and says... May I sit with you? He's pushing the boundaries. He's going to those places where no one would have expected him to go, and he's eating with people that he's not supposed to eat with. I mean, after all, we're talking about tax collectors here, right? And nobody has ever in the history of time liked tax collectors. I apologize to you and your family members who work for the IRS, but nobody has ever liked tax collectors. And Levi would have been one of the most hated. Levi was probably standing there at a tax collector's booth at the border that people used to be able to go across very freely. But now that Rome controls the road, they're having to stop and pay a toll. Now He would have been hated Because as the Romans came in and as they conquered, even though they maintained control, they would have needed local people who spoke the language and understood the customs, and they would have probably employed them to take up the tax for them. 
So here was one who used to be part of that good Jewish community. And now, in the minds of the good Jews, he has sold them out. Now, we don't know Levi's story, at least up to this point. We don't know if he had a bad reputation like so many tax collectors of the time did of driving the price off and skimming off the top and profiting off the misery of his own people. Maybe he did that. And maybe he was evil at heart and he liked the fact that he was advancing when all of the others around him did not. But we don't know that. Maybe it was the only job that Levi could find. And between starving and working for the enemy, he chose the latter. He suffered the consequences for it. He suffered because he would not have been welcomed in the community. He would have not have been welcomed in the synagogues. He would not have been welcomed, most likely, even at the table of his own family. And then Jesus comes and says, follow me. And he leaves the tax collector's booth and starts following And then Jesus is sitting at his table. But it's not just the tax collectors. There's that all-encompassing other term of quote-unquote sinners who are also at the dinner table that night. And that would have simply meant anyone who stood outside of the good community at that point. They didn't keep the law the, the way they were supposed to. They didn't make the sacrifices. They did not observe the rituals. They simply did not do things the way that they were expected to do them. Or maybe even they could have been unclean Gentiles. And they're left to ask, what is he doing with them? Well, if you know anything about Jesus, you know that when he comes preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand, that kingdom is working underneath the one of this world to flip it on its head. And it is as if he wants to say to them, the system that you find yourself lifted up and privileged by has always been broken. And there's a new system that is being created One that God has always been at work in the world to create. One that says that all people can be used for the good of the kingdom of God. Now I'd love to say that after Jesus died on the cross and rose again, all was at last made abundantly clear. And from that point to this, we have been following Christ's example and moving to all of those places that Jesus himself moved. But alas, we're human, and we all know that's not the case. I mean, just look not too far after Jesus at the way that Paul had to deal with this. In our Wednesday noon Bible study, we've been studying the letter to the Galatians, and we have been reading and understanding the way that Paul had come preaching that Christ was for everyone, and Christ was bringing all people of faith together at last, and yet there were missionaries of the Jews who still followed Jesus, but wanted everyone to become first like them and observe the law before they could become fully incorporated into the faith community. And Paul said, that's not the way that Jesus works. But there is, because of Christ, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but all are one, even in their uniquenesses, welcome at Christ's own table. There's a story that I can share, probably because it doesn't hit too close to home for us, because it's not our story, but I was reminded of it again this week. And someone posted a video of uh, the history of the First Baptist Church of Asheville, North Carolina. And their pastor was talking about a time in 1964 when Cecil Sherman, who many people in the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship would know as a famous and great preacher, was six weeks into what would become a 20-year tenure. And at the conclusion of the worship service that week, there was a young African-American woman who'd been sitting in the back of the worship service, and she came up to Dr. Sherman. She had been sitting there and had been attending for a little while with other young African-American women from a nearby school, and she said, Dr. Sherman, can I be a member of your church? Dr. Sherman looked at her and said, well, have you professed faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? She said, I have. 
He said, have you been baptized by immersion after your profession of faith as would have been required of their church at that time? And she said, I have. And then he said, well, then come next Sunday at the conclusion of worship and you shall be received as a member of our church. The chair of deacons was waiting in the wings, listening to this entire conversation. And after it was over, he came up to Dr. Sherman and said, Dr. Sherman, when you're finished greeting everyone, I'd like to see you in your office if you don't mind. And he brought with him a copy of a policy that said that every person who was going to be a member of that church needed to be affirmed unanimously in order for them to become a full member. He said, Dr. Sherman, if this woman comes next week, she will not receive a full affirmation. She will not have a unanimous vote. And it will draw the attention of the news and it will make us look bad. So you need to go and tell her that she cannot come and present herself as a member of the church. Dr. Sherman said, I work for you people, and I will do anything that you ask me to do. But what you have asked me to do is immoral, and it would be as if you had asked me to rob a bank. I cannot do it. And it set off a five-month-long firestorm within that church. Yes, it did draw the attention of the news, The sheriff came to Dr. Sherman and told him he needed to tread lightly if he knew what was good for him. A dentist lost patience because of what they had read in the news. A lawyer in the church went to the search team and said if they had just gotten someone a little drier, a little less wet behind the ears, then they would not be in this problem. Because Dr. Sherman was 36 years old when he started, which incidentally is five years older than when I started as pastor here at Augusta Road Baptist. There were 40 families that left the church or stopped giving. And Dr. Sherman and his wife had to go to this young woman brokenhearted and simply tell her what was going on in the life of their church. She never came back. And it was six years later when the dust had settled And perhaps Christ had finally had the say that an African-American couple finally joined that church and were members even, I believe, up until recently when one of them passed. Now, I'd like to say that that is an uncommon story, but let's be honest, at least here in the South, we all have stories like that. And yes, at one time it started as race, but it's never ended there. It's always been about race or economic status or political party or the way you live your life, whatever it may be. But we have always found reasons to keep people at arm's length because they were not like us and they simply made us feel too uncomfortable. And we questioned whether or not the good news for us was just as good if it was good news for them too. But if we stay in that type of mentality and if we think that the good news is reserved for us and us alone, then we begin to devalue all of those others who are out there. And if we're not careful, we could look up and see that Christ has left our table and gone to be with them. If we do not embrace the Christian ethic of love that we find most clearly in our Lord and Savior, in the ways that we find it in our Lord and Savior, then we risk hunkering down and withering away and becoming defined by what we are not and not what we are. And we risk living into that great phrase written by Anne Lamott when she said, that you know you have made God into your own image when God hates the same people that you do. I've reminded this week of God's overwhelming love in a beautiful way, not in illustration necessarily, but in song. As I was gathered in Chattanooga with colleagues who are all part of a pastoral preaching ministry, and we got to watch as one of our colleagues and embraced us in one of his initiatives that he calls gospel gothic it's 
a radio show that he has that uses primarily actually secular music, but discusses the way that faith is expressed through it. The band that was playing at the time played a beautiful Sean Mullins tune that I suggest you all go and listen to. It's called Give God the Blues. Some of the words go like this. God ain't no Republican. He ain't no Democrat. He ain't even independent. God's above all that. Bigger than religion, he's got a better plan. The sign says God's gone fishing for the soul of every man. God loves old bartenders, the preachers, the whores and fools, and that karaoke singer, just a ruining, don't be cruel. The winners and the losers, the prisoners and the free, all the saints and sinners, even you and me. God loves everybody, but we all give God the blues. Yeah, we all give God the blues. Yeah, we all give God the blues. Perhaps the challenging word for us today is to remember that if God loves everyone, then that means that no one is privileged above anyone else. And we are all invited because of the grace and love of Jesus Christ that is given to us to go and stand where Jesus himself stood and even sit where Jesus himself sat. And say to all those who are out there who feel broken and beaten down and rejected and despised, most especially by the church itself, we see you and we stand for you just like Jesus did. Because after all, we are here gathered on this particular Sunday, which is World Communion Sunday. It is the reminder to us all that all people of faith throughout history, regardless of tradition and location, have been gathered together at the Lord's table that extends on through infinity and beyond. And we have incredible volunteers who always prepare these elements for us. But remember that their work is a symbol of the fact that it is Jesus Christ himself who prepares this table. And if it's his table, then all people of faith are welcome, no matter what. Amen.